How to interpret the Bible correctly. You could read the same Bible passage. Read the same Bible passage. Two people come up with two different interpretations. As you can see on the screens, the Bible says this. No, it doesn't. It says this other thing. Right? So the question is, who's to say? Who's to say who's right if two different people have two different interpretations? Let me give some examples. So, very common verse in the Bible. You might have heard of it. John 3, 16. Um, starts out, For God so loved the world. Uh, so one person says, John 3, 16. They read the verse. They say, That means that um, God loves you, so you should turn away from your sins and follow Christ. That's the meaning of the verse. One person says that. Somebody else says, no, it says God loves the whole world, not just Christians. That's the meaning. That means that you don't have to do anything because God loves you, so you're fine. So an, an implication of this other uh, interpretation, the one on the right, an implication of it is... You can believe that Krishna is God and, not, and that Jesus was not God and still go to heaven because God loves the whole world. I've heard people interpret it that way. So who controls the meaning? That's the underlying question there. Um, so, <laughs> we're going to look at it. Is it the... Is the meaning in the author, or is it in the message, or is it the reader? Um, where is the meaning? Who controls the meaning? Okay, let's do some everyday examples um, for who controls the meaning. Let's say there is a dating couple, and they send some written communication. And this boy here sends the girl this letter, and he says, I think we should see other people, but let's stay friends. Now, now, she reads this letter and she says, you know, um, you know what I think he's saying? This letter, to me, this says that my boyfriend says, we're a couple, but let's see other couples. Let's see other people. So he wants to double date um, together as a couple. So that's the first part. We should see other people. And let's stay friends. What he means by that I think the meaning there is, let's not be, once we're married, let's not be like one of those couples that's bickering all the time. Let's stay friends. So she said, wow, this is really getting serious. He's thinking about the future of our relationship. She's going to be by herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how she interprets the letter. So she's saying she thinks she still has a boyfriend. But does she still have a boyfriend? No. 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 Okay, because the author controls the meaning. That should be super obvious in, a, in this example, but for some reason when it comes to the Bible, it's not super obvious. So, um, let's look at some other examples here. Um, if, if you believe that the reader controls the meaning, and a lot of people do, you're going to ask different kinds of questions when you come to the Bible. So if you believe the author controls the meaning, you're going to say, what does the author mean by this? But if you think the reader controls it, you're going to ask, what does this mean to me? Now, I had a guy in my church named Jeff Wayne and when I was a pastor in Indiana, and I was preaching, and he said, but pastor... What difference does it make? Okay? So I said, well, this is God's word. This is what he's saying to you. If God were here in person saying this to you, would you say this to God? What difference does it make? And God said, well, I want you to hear this. And while he's talking, you're going... Would you do that if God were speaking to you? It's not necessarily always only about what it means to you. The first question you ask is, 
What does the author mean by this? And then, then you can apply it to yourself. And some passages will have more application, some will have less. Um, other things you'll ask if you believe the author controls the meaning, which the author does. What does the author want to say? If you believe that the reader controls it, you'll say, what do I want to hear? Now, this should be super obvious. Just the common sense, the sane way to interpret things. Okay? Um, it's not that this is just Jacob's method of interpretation. This is just the method of interpreting anything. Now, it gets a little tricky can get a little tricky, it's about to, uh, because what if you're listening to a song by John Lennon and he says, I get by with a little help from my friends. Mm -hmm. And let's just say, uh, for the sake of argument, that when he says friends, he means drugs. So he's saying, you know, a little LSD can get you through the dark times. But when I listen to that song and when I sing that song, I mean friends like people. Okay, so that's, I'm using just the method that I to told you was wrong a minute ago. I'm hearing those words that John Lennon wrote, and I'm saying, well, you know what? To me, when I sing it, I'm just talking about my friends, people. Okay, that's what I'm doing, and that's okay in this situation, because in this situation, this is what I'm deep down what I'm saying. I don't care what you have to say, John Lennon. I want, I want to make up my own meaning for your song. I don't care what the author says. But the problem is that when people read the Word of God, if they say, I control the meaning, really deep down they're saying, I don't care what you have to say, God. I do not care what you meant by this. I'm making up my own meaning. So for a lot of people, that's the step you have to get them to see. They don't real for some people, they don't realize they're doing that. They're deceiving themselves. But deep down, um, they're saying, I don't care what God has to say. I want to make this mean what I want it to mean. Okay, so let's take an example of something God said in His Word. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, uh, someone who believes in uh, the reader controls the meaning, sometimes called reader response, they might say, this means be positive. And an implication of that is, everyone's going to heaven. See, don't grumble, don't complain, just be positive. You don't need to dispute. Everybody's going to heaven. Some people would say that's the interpretation. And there's people who do interpret it that way. Um, and if you haven't met them, you will. And the first time you talk to someone who interprets the Bible that way, you're blown away. And you, you're like, well, they're using the Bible, and I know they're coming up with the wrong stuff, but I'm not really seeing how they're getting that. Hopefully, after hearing this, you'll be like, okay, I see what they're doing now. I can talk to them about this. And I can start to talk to them about who controls the meaning, you or the author. If you read the same verse and you think the author controls the meaning, one of the things it means, at least the first part is, it's never okay to complain. And an implication of that is, so whenever I do complain, I need to repent. And all the things that come along with repentance, remorse, turning away from it, changing, asking God to help you change by His strength, all of that. Okay, so who's to say? Um, that's the question. The author is the one to say. I'm going to beat this dead horse a little bit more just to make sure you really got this point, okay? Really quickly, if the text is a stop sign and you say, well, I, the reader and the driver, I'm interpreting that to mean slow down and roll through, which I did, I, I did that when I was 16. And the police officer who stopped me right after that, you know, and I said, but officer, see, I read that, and to me that means slow down. And he said, well, guess what? The author of that sign, that one word sign, is the local government and their employees, and we, the real interpretation means stop. And so I got a ticket, which 
when I was making five twenty-five an hour, that ticket really hurt. Uh, remember. I remembered. Yes, yes. Luckily, I didn't cry. Um, <laughs> okay. One last example. If you get an electric bill and you say, "Well, I interpret this amount due to be a suggested donation," <laughs> and so I'm not going to donate to the to a good cause this time. Well, you can interpret it that way if you want, but pretty soon you'll be reading that electric bill in the dark because eventually they're going to shut off your power. Okay, so remember though, the Bible says even from among your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. This is a really sneaky way of distorting the truth because they're actually using the Bible. So there's lots of churches that use the Bible and they interpret it a different way and they come out with a totally different meaning. And if you're not paying attention to what's happening, you'll be deceived. So, how, practically speaking, do we interpret correctly? Here are some common sense rules. Number one, the author controls the meaning. We just spent a long time on that. Okay, what questions do you have about that, that concept? Any questions about that author controlling the meaning? I spent a lot of time on that because that is, as you can see on your handout, that is the foundation of all correct interpretation. You have to go in thinking, I need to figure out what the author was trying to say, not what I want to hear. Okay. So the author controls the meaning, it's the foundation, and it should be obvious. If it's not obvious, um, you should raise your hand because you have a question. Okay. Basically, it comes down to respect. I respect God's word and I submit to God's word because what he says matters, not what I like. Okay, that's the first rule for interpreting correctly. A second one, and this one, many people at our church do wrong and they don't like this rule, but the second rule is you must interpret the Bible in this order. First, you observe it. Second, you interpret it. And third, you apply it. You apply it last. You must do it in that order. If you do it in a different order, it's going to be a disaster. So you, so you must, what must you do before you interpret? You must observe. What must you, you not do until after you interpret? It's apply. Here's an example of someone doing it in the wrong order. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Ephesians. Let's see. Lynn, could you read this verse for us? On the, on the screen, yeah. <clears throat> oh. But because of this great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Okay, so let's say someone does it in the wrong order and they skip the observation and they jump right to interpretation. They glance down at this verse and they say, okay, here's what this means. This means God loves us and see God, and God's rich. So, you know, if I were rich, I would give money to all the people I love. So this verse means, I'm not even going to really take my time and observe the verse. I'm just going to interpret it immediately. This verse means that God's going to give me money. Because God's rich and God loves us. <clears throat> well, it says God who is rich and God loves us. What, right, but they didn't observe it carefully first. Has anyone ever heard of Joel Olstein? Yes. Okay, this is the kind of... In now, he's a little more, little more careful. I'm exaggerating it here. It's super obvious here. But, but he, this is a message he preaches. Okay, so we skipped observation. We interpreted it immediately. Now we just jump to application. Without even a careful interpretation, we just jump to application. So that means I'm going to, I don't have money now, but I can put stuff on my credit card. That way, when God gives me money, because the Bible says so, then I can pay off the credit card bill. You see why the order is very important? You have to take your time and observe the Word of God before you interpret it. And make sure your interpretation is correct before you apply it. 
uh, that would, I mean, that would be a form of observing it. There's lots of different ways and tools that we're going to get to. This is a six-week class. Okay. <laughs> we're going to get to all that stuff. <laughs> I'm just teaching some basic rules. We're going to practically apply them today a little bit and more in future classes. There's a lot of prosperity preaching today. Uh, yes. <clears throat> now, they mask their poor interpretation a little better than I'm masking it here. I made it super obvious here so you can see that you need to observe it carefully first. <clears throat> okay, so this, um, this guy here, um, he was, when I was first an assistant pastor many moons ago, he was the head pastor. <clears throat> and he told me a story a long time ago uh, when he first got out of college, he was an engineer and he had a dream job as an engineer because he was constantly designing different things. Um, and uh, so he loved doing it. It wasn't doing the same type of thing. It was all different things. But he took a, a Bible class at a college nearby, <clears throat> which ended up changing his life. And this is the assignment that changed his life. The professor said, <clears throat> okay, read this passage and write down 30 things you observe from it. So, you know, he read a couple paragraphs and, you know, he observed uh, it's, there's a lot of commands in it and I notice that it's uh, from Paul and I notice um, that he uses a lot of emotional words, whatever, just anything he can observe. Just wrote them down. <clears throat> he got back to class, turned them in, and the professor said, no, keep them, do 30 more new ones. So they're like, okay, you know. <clears throat> came up with 30 new observations on the same passage, went back to class, professor did it again, 30 more. So now he's like, okay, it tends to, a lot of the verbs are in past tense. Um, you know, he's like looking up Greek things. <clears throat> I don't remember how many times the professor kept doing it, making him get more and more observations. And then after four or five times, the professor said, now, in class, I want you to write down what basically is this passage saying? What's the big point here? And it was super easy. And he had read that, gone over that passage over and over, carefully thinking about it, observing it. <clears throat> and then when it came time to say, what's the overall point here? It was obvious and easy to him. <clears throat> and then he realized, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to study a passage. I want to tell people, this is basically what this says. And so his sermons were really good because each sermon had one big thing he was getting across that was from God, not from him. So he was a pastor for the rest of his career. Okay, so observation, while it may seem tedious, because we want to get to the interpretation part and the application part, what difference does it make? But we have to take our time and go slow and really observe. It comes down to respect and work. Do you respect God and His Word enough to do the work? That's what it comes down to. What questions do you have about the order of Bible study? Any questions? Okay. If you think of one, go ahead. But we're going to move on very briefly on your worksheet. You can see that the next one is context. I'm not going to spend much time on this because we will spend time on it. So number three on page one is context. Basically, you have a part of the Bible is your text. And your context is what is with, con means with, with your text. Meaning, if I'm reading verse four, then of chapter 3, I'm reading verse 4, the rest of the chapter is the context, or at the very least, the paragraph before and the paragraph after your verse. Really, the context is the whole book that you're reading, and the context of that is the whole Bible. But, but you can't just take something out of context. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Context should be Oh, it's not on the screen. Uh, there it is. Context. Okay. 
Any questions about context? Not about context, but before we observe, shouldn't we pray? Shouldn't we always pray before? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I would, the only reason I limited it to these is because <clears throat> this is how you study the Bible. But praying beforehand, I was sort of dividing prayer and Bible study as separate things. People mix them together, and I think that's a great thing to do. Um, but we've done classes on prayer before. This is focusing specifically on just the Bible study. But that's a great point about praying. Okay, and then number four on page one is literal versus figurative. <clears throat> um, or some people want to call it metaphor, allegory, symbolism. Um, you, you can get some very bizarre interpretations if you believe everything is figurative. Um, but in the Bible, as in life, it should be really obvious when someone's using a figure of speech. They're like, oh, I got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> right? The person's not like, oh my, gross. What are you, is it choking you? Is it still alive? What? <laughs> no, that was a figure of speech. Oh. It should be super obvious. And it's super obvious in the Bible, too, right? When Jesus says, I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. No normal person is walking away from that thinking, oh, I thought Jesus was a human being and God. I guess he turns out he's a gate. <laughs> right, right. The figures of speech should be obvious. Okay, and that comes, it all comes down to respect. You respect God's word enough to know that he controls the meaning and you take your time with it and you think about it and you, you don't just rip stuff out of context. You take it in the context it's in. Okay, so let's dive in. Okay, page two. I gave you some passages and some tips. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Natalie, could you read uh, the introduction to purpose and result statements? Always identify purpose statements or result statements. Purpose slash result phrases or sentences describe the reason, result, or consequence of some action. <clears throat> they are frequently introduced with conjunctions, such as so that, in order that, so, that, or to. In the following verses, circle the purpose result word and then interpret the correlation between the two parts that this word connects. Okay, <clears throat> so here's an example. Um, Bob locked the car so that no one could rob it. Okay, so I circled the so that. That's the, that's the connecting uh, phrase. Sometimes it's just one word. And then the, my interpretation is Bob's reason for locking the car was to prevent theft of the items in the car. Okay, so we're focusing on interpreting the purpose correlation. There's more in each verse that you can interpret, but what does the fact that it's a result or a purpose statement, what does that tell us? Um, one last thing about my example sentence. If it had said Bob locked the car so that no one could steal it, change the word rob to steal, that now it's talking about He's worried about them stealing the entire car, not the items in the car. So little, little nuances can <clears throat> make a big difference, but we're focusing on <clears throat> really on the, the correlation between the two parts. One is a purpose for the other. Okay, so let's do number one together, and then you can do two through four silently. Um, let's see, Bev, could you read number one? Okay, let's all take a minute and look at that. It's uh, Psalm 119.11. And let's look for, without saying anything, let's look for the, the purpose statement, the connecting word. And you can circle it when you find it. Oh, I've 
hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So what is the word that shows it's a purpose statement? That, that yes, very specifically. So the action is I hid your word in my heart. The reason, the purpose is that or so that or in order that I might not sin against you. So you, your interpretation would be um, the reason the psalmist hid God's word in his heart was for the purpose of not sinning against God. And now you can think of some application and some more some further things about it. Yeah, that's true. If you don't have God's word in your heart, how are you going to know what's a sin and what's not? You're going to end up sinning against God because you don't know his word. Okay. So, that's your interpretation. It, the interpretation would be the reason the psalmist hid God's word in his heart is so he wouldn't sin against God. Okay, now, take some time and do two through four silently or with someone near you if you want. You can talk about it. And then we will discuss them together. I know it seems tedious. I know that. But just trust me, when we get to larger passages, these little kinds of things will drastically change your theology and even your denomination. Okay. It's all right if you didn't get finished. <clears throat> we'll go through them together. So, um, um, Loretta, could you read number two? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Okay, so what word is showing the purpose or result? That. That. Good. Yes, I asked them to do that for sound effects, dramatic effects. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, that. And then what would be the interpretation? Anyone? The, the interpretation specifically of the, the purpose result aspect of this. Um, God loves us so much that he gave Christ as a sacrifice for the atonement for our sins. <sighs> yes, that is what the verse means. Can you focus on the purpose? To redeem us from our sins. How about this? Start out with the reason God gave his son. Why? Right. To allow us to be forgiven and to go to heaven. Right. So, um, <clears throat> yes, I know. If there's lots of context. But th what this says is, um, for God so loved the world that, here's the reason, I'm um, sorry, um, the purpose, he gave his only son. So, <clears throat> the reason that God gave his only son was because he loved the world. That's the reason or the result God loved the world, and it resulted in him giving his son. <clears throat> Did love produce giving? Did love what? Produce giving. Did love produce giving? Yeah. I never thought of it in those terms, but yeah. Mm -hmm. His love for the world produced resulted in, was the reason for giving his son. <clears throat> Can you personalize these things and make it for me? Um, well, I mean, if you're part of the world... Yeah, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. I don't know about the world, but it's for me. Well, yeah, we just have to be careful because sometimes something's not for me, but I take it as, right? right. Um, so you just have to be careful. But in this case... It certainly is about you because you're part of the world. And um, now, there's more interpretation we could do, um, but um, he gave his son for you also. And the reason... He loved me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's more reasons. 
but this is the one here. More reasons are for God's glory. Um, but that's not what John 3.16 mentions. Okay, good. All right. Uh, uh, Debbie, could you read number three? For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So what word is the purpose result word? Two. Two. Yes, in this case it's just a simple word two. Um, so like, I created this machine to wash my clothes for me. That's the purpose of the machine. Or sometimes it could be the result of what the machine does, but in that case, the purpose. So what would the interpretation of this verse be? Anyone want to? The reason we do good works is because we are God's handiwork. Um, the reason we do good works is because we are God's handiwork. Uh, let me think about that for one second. What's yours, Natalie? God created us to serve Him through Christ and do good works. Okay, right. God created us to do good works. That's the purpose of our creation. I'm just shorten it up to I was created to do good works. Right. Yes, I was created to do good works. But we're trying to, to flesh out the word to. The purpose, the reason I was created was to do good works. Um, we glorify him. Well, that's true. I don't know that this what what's actually written there says about anything about glory. What were you going to say, Wit? A result of God's work in us is to produce good works. Yeah. So, so yeah, it could be a result, could be a purpose. Um, what? Read yours again, Mark. The reason we do. Good works is because we are God's handiwork. Okay, yeah. So the way you phrased it is in line with Wit's thing. Yeah, yeah. it's the result. Um, if you if you turn it around, it becomes uh, the reason I was created. Like I created this machine to wash my clothes. That's its purpose. Now it doesn't necessarily. Sometimes it's result, sometimes it's purpose. I'm not necessarily saying which it is right now, but I want us to think about those things. The reason I lean toward result is because of that other little word in the, the beginning, the word for. Right. Now, <laughs> technically that would connect us back to what's come before, and so we'd have to take all that into consideration. <laughs> right now we're just doing baby steps. Okay, yeah, so the, yeah, the, the fact that we were created in Christ Jesus, that is what produces good works. Or um, the reason he didn't just create us in a vacuum, created us in Jesus. Yeah, good. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's, um, you could say, um, well, for the sake of today, you could do it either way. You could say the reason God created us was to do good works, or the reason we do good works is because God created us. And you'd have to do a lot more observation and thinking and taking it into context and stuff that we'll learn later to determine whether it's a result or a purpose. But you can see that they're similar, right? I went to the store to get milk. Okay. To get milk is the result of going to the store, but it's also your purpose for going to the store. So there, there's some overlap there. Um, yes? Uh, lots of people do good works. Shriners, Masons, mm -hmm. they're not in Christ Jesus. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, it doesn't, you know... To use the milk analogy, lots of people get milk, but in my case, I went to the store to get milk. So, so in my case, God created me in Christ Jesus 
And what it produced, or the reason for it, was to do good works. But we're always supposed to do those good works in Jesus' name. Right, yeah. Which is the whole point of saying created in Christ Jesus. Which is the whole point? Well, that tells where and how we were created. Um, this verse, what you're saying is true. I don't know that this verse specifically teaches and make sure you do it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Go, ahead. Go ahead. Is it possible that God created someone for not good works? For not doing good works, they were created for some other purpose. Um, well, what we're trying to do is interpret the verse we have, so we can't really get into that right now. But... Those are good questions, and the Bible does address all kinds of things like that. Oh, okay. So, would, would I, is it too far to say that we cannot experience God's handiwork unless it is through Christ Jesus? Well, in this case, we are God's handiwork, so we can't experience being God's handiwork. Okay. The fact that I am God's handiwork. Um, now... At a, in a, at a different level, everyone is God's handiwork. Um, but there's a deeper level once you're created in Christ. Okay, good. Let's move on to number four. Um, let's see here. Um, Bev, could you read this one? Listen, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may So what word or words is the result word? So the purpose? Yeah, this purpose statement. Uh, so that, but there's another one. Yeah, this says, so that this and that something else. So there's two here. Jacob, uh, Rick Warren details in interpreting scripture to use your name in front of when you interpret Right. Here's the problem. Um, you're jumping to application when you do that. So first we want to understand what God's saying to Israel. And then apply it. And then after you're saying, then you can apply it. And sometimes there's not a direct, like something God says to David, I can't necessarily, right? Like if, if God says, don't build my house to David, and I put Jacob in there, like, well, I guess I shouldn't yeah, build, build a t in, in You have to be careful, yeah. So, so you interpret first, uh, and then you draw principles from it, then you can... Um, now, it works a lot better in the New Testament when he's writing to Christians and to churches. Right. We fit into that context so much more, more easily, and most of the time, in the epistles, you can put your name there. And yeah. this is from the Old Testament, so there's a couple extra steps you have to do. Uh, I heard somebody say something over here. But I don't, somebody have something they wanted to say about this? So the two are that it and that you? Uh, well, so that and that. Okay, so what the command here is listen and be careful to obey. Okay, that's the command. Um, and here is... Uh, the result of obeying and listening and obeying. Uh, maybe here is the motivation or the reason for listening or obeying. That will take to determine which uh, will take a little more digging more than we're going to do right now. But anyway, so the result of listening and obeying is the reason for it is what? It will go well with you. It will go well with you and that you may... Yeah, increase greatly. Good. Okay, that one hopefully was a little easier. And then this one, extra tricky because there's a lot of words. Um, but uh, let's see. Sue, could you read number five?
Okay, so there's lots of observation we should be doing. We should notice that with Christ and in Christ and in Christ Jesus, those are repeated. Lots of other things. But for right now, we're focusing on just the purpose statement. So what phrase, word, or words show us that there's a purpose statement here? In order that. Yeah. Now, in order that is nice because it tells us this one isn't really, this one is leaning towards purpose, not result. So what would be the interpretation here? Um, okay, yeah, Sh okay, I'm going to just tweak what you said. You said showing us His incredible grace. Um, let's just make it more general and just say showing. Because this doesn't really tell who it's showing to. But to somebody or some ones, He is showing His incomparable riches of His grace. He's showing His grace, and that's why... He raised us up, seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. So, the reason God raised us up and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, the reason for doing that is in order that in the ages to come He might show His grace. Mm -hmm. So, the result of my salvation and the purpose of my salvation is to show off God's grace in the ages to come. So in the future, forever, God will be able to say, in a manner of speaking, say, look how gracious I am. I saved Jacob Franz. Look how undeserving he was and look at how gracious I was to make him into what he is now, forever. I'm a, I will be a trophy of God's grace. I actually am now, it's just not as obvious. <laughs> <clears throat> There's so much basic theology in this verse without understanding with Christ, in Christ, people read that and it doesn't mean anything to the average person because they don't have a background <clears throat> in the terminology, what those terms mean. Yeah. Words, and words mean something and without definition of words, <clears throat> right, exactly. And, that's and, why idioms get people fits. Yeah, but what we're trying to do right now is just focus on, so you can recognize a purpose statement or a result statement. We're starting with baby steps. We're going to get into bigger things as we go. Okay, uh, what we need to do though um, is talk about some reasons why people interpret incorrectly. Um, so on the next page, some of these, they start out pretty obvious, they get a little more complex. Um, they don't believe in God. That's the first one. Yeah, they're going to interpret it wrong, probably, if they don't believe in God. Um, and you get secular historians studying the Bible for historical purposes, and they interpret it way wrong. Um, they refuse to submit to God's authority over them. Okay? Uh, I won't submit. Now, that um, can be sometimes openly defiant. Okay, they read the Bible and they say, I will not submit to this. Okay, and so I'm going I'm to, whatever. Um, but it can also be that they're deceiving themselves. So I have uh, 2B and 2C um, as a little more subtle. Uh, so someone could say, I use the reader controls meaning approach. Um, that's why I interpret it this way. But their secret hidden reason for interpreting that way is that they won't submit to God. And I've heard people do this. You say, well, look what the Bible says. It says you should do X, Y, and Z. And they say, oh, no, to me that means this other thing. I control the meaning. And I'm obeying what God says, and this is what it says to me. So really, deep down, they don't want to obey what God says. So they, for that reason use that. Now, that's one case. Another reason, still on 2B, that they might use that a reader controls the meaning, 
is because they were just taught that. They had a false teacher telling them that's how you interpret the Bible. And we'll come to false teachers in a moment. Uh, to see, okay, they could say the author me meant X. So, yes, the author controls the meaning, and here's what the author meant, X. In this case, X stands for a wrong interpretation. Um, I had someone say this to me. I said, you know, uh, your lifestyle is wrong. Let's read Romans 1 together. And they said, oh, see, this is, this is saying that homosexuality is wrong um, when it's leaving the natural use of sex. And so what this is saying is what the author meant, what God, the Holy Spirit, and Paul meant here was homosexuality is wrong for straight people because that's their natural bent is for heterosexuality. If they commit do homosexuality, then it's a sin. But for me, it's natural, so it's right. That was their interpretation. I yeah, I didn't know what to say at the time um, because they were saying, "I believe in this is God's word. It's God controls the meaning. The author controls the meaning, and this is what they mean." Now. Deep down, the hidden meaning was, I don't want to submit to what God says. Or it could be, in some cases, I believe in my own version of God. The God I believe in would never do X, Y, and Z that you believe. Right, but she was, she was focusing on the woman part. Yeah. <laughs> she said, even their women leave the natural use of the woman. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, she was, yeah. Um, so, um, so there's three reasons why they might do that. They say the author means this wrong thing. They won't submit. They believe in their own version of God who would never send people to hell or something like that. Um, or maybe they were just taught wrong. And that brings us to number three, um, false teachers. So they could interpret the Bible wrongly because they were taught an incorrect method of interpretation. Um, now, remember, these different things are not mutually exclusive. People can mix and match different reasons for interpreting the Bible wrong. So, they could have been taught, now that RCM is reader controls meaning, sometimes called reader response, or maybe they were taught everything in the Bible is symbolic, and so you can't just read it and say this is what it means, it means what it says. No, there's a deeper hidden meaning. You get into like Gnosticism, start to go that direction. There's a secret hidden meaning if you understand the sim symbolism. <clears throat> and one last very important one is sometimes people interpret it wrong because they were never taught how to interpret the Bible for themselves. <clears throat> this happens all over our country. A pastor will present a truth. Now maybe in his preaching and teaching, Maybe it's a right truth, maybe it's a wrong truth. In this case, let's assume it's a right truth. And the pastor gets up and says, here's what the Bible says. Very vague. Following Jesus involves repenting of your sins. They just say that. And you're just expected to believe it. What the pastor should do, generally speaking, is say, let me show you where from Scripture, and how I interpreted that. So, <clears throat> he takes these different pieces, and you can see those shapes are going to add up to that square there. Um, <clears throat> so, here's the different pieces. Now, let me teach you how I put them together. Okay? So, A, we have is uh, Matthew 4, and B is Matthew 28. So, in Matthew 4, it says, And Jesus started his ministry preaching, and this is what he preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew gives a summary of Jesus' message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Coming soon. Then in Matthew 28, after he's paid for people's sins, after he's risen from the dead, as he's about to ascend, he gives the Great Commission. Because some people say, no, the repentance was before, once the cross came, repentance isn't involved anymore. Jesus just paid for it all. You don't have to repent. You don't have to do anything. That's what some people say. 
But if you put those two together in Matthew 28, at the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go into all the world. Make disciples. Go make Teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Well, what did Jesus command? To repent. So even after the resurrection, the disciples were still supposed to go out and teach Jesus' message, which involved repentance. So you're putting that together. Put that together with, you know, 1 John. 1 John, that's what Yeah, put that together with 1 John um, <clears throat> 1 9. You know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Um, and put that together with Revelation 22. In the end of the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible, he's describing heaven and the new heaven and the new earth. He said, describes all this wonderful stuff, and he said, outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral. There's a couple more I can't think of at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so um, even at the end uh, of the Bible, he's saying, if you're doing those things, you're not going to be in the kingdom. You need to repent of those things, turn to Christ for forgiveness, and all of that. So, what you're supposed to get every week is not just truth, but how you got the truth out of the Bible. Okay? Because if you're just receiving truth, I don't know how it comes out of the Bible. I don't know how pastor's coming up with this stuff, but I just trust my pastor. Well, that's... You might get lucky and have a good pastor, but if you're not, you happen to have a bad pastor who's a false teacher, or you happen to have not a pastor, but an imam or some other religion teaching you something, if you just trust them, you're going to be led astray. You have to take the Bible with <clears throat> you, know. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay, so that's uh, reason number four, if people never even taught the Bible for themselves. And the last one that happens here, this is where it gets to you, sloppy or lazy interpretation. This happens all the time in our church, in this class. I see it all the time. <clears throat> and the reason is because, well, let's look at the handout. We're diving in again, a little bit deeper this time. One of the reasons is they have a low reading comprehension. Some people, when they look at a page of the Bible or a paragraph or a sentence, they just see a sea of words and they just have very poor reading comprehension. Um, so um, for that person who struggles with that, when they read a, a verse like Ephesians 1, 2, Natalie, could you read that? So they just need to say, okay, I read that sentence. What did that say? Now, <clears throat> it's going to help if they read the context. So Natalie, read the next box that includes the context. Paul, an apostle, uh, excuse me, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that gave us a little bit of context that what came before. <clears throat> so what did that say? The, the, the verse, verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. What did it say? It said what? I didn't hear you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What is that saying? You're right, Paul is saying this to the Christians, the faithful in Christ Jesus, the Christians in Ephesus. What is he saying to them? The very first thing he says to them. Sorry, what? Um, yeah, it's a way of greeting them, first of all, and he's saying, you know, I want God to give you grace and peace. I want it to come from God and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Grace and peace to you from God. That's the gospel, isn't it? 
Well, no takes yeah, it would take a lot of unpacking to get the details, yes. But, um, yeah. So, basically, whatever grace and peace means here, the point is, what he's saying is, I'm wishing, I'm praying, I want God to give you grace and peace. So if you have low reading comprehension, you need to go that slow or slower and think. It's not just a group of words, it's a sentence. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? You have to really stop and think about it because maybe you think, well, if I do that, by the time I'm done to my devotions, I'll be through one sentence. Well, better to understand one sentence than to not understand three pages. Well, you can't understand grace and peace the last verse without reading the rest of it. Well, I understand that, but if you can't, if you're not good at reading comprehension, you don't want to just read, okay, I don't know what I just read, but I checked it off, I read the Bible today. Better to read one verse and understand it than a hundred verses and not understand any of them. Well, yeah, yeah, but the point is, if you have low reading comprehension, you have to really, really slow down. Okay, Um, next reason why people do sloppy or lazy interpretation is some people do not try to comprehend the Bible. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. They can read, they can comprehend, but when it comes to the Bible, they just pick random words and attach arbitrary spiritual significance. People do this all the time. Let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Carol. What? Carol. Carol. Can you read that verse there, Ephesians 1 3? Which one? 1 3. It's in the box. Ephesians, Ephesians 1 3. Okay. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Okay, so if I um, uh, if I said, okay, what does this mean? And the person said, this verse means that God blesses us and we're all going to heaven or the heavenly realms so we should be, and we should be spiritual and we should uh, be spiritual blessings to other Christians and it's all for Christ Jesus because he loved us first. If they said that, would you say they're wrong? I mean, the things they said, some of them are true, but that's not what that verse is saying at all. Um, this, this kind of interpretation results from skipping observation. This person just looked down and saw some words and started randomly saying whatever interpretation popped into their head. And in this case, and people do this all the time, what mattered was that it sounded right. What didn't matter at all was what Paul was trying to say in that verse. We've had a little bit of that even today where people are adding things in that they know sound good. They say, what does this verse mean? And they're adding stuff in. It wasn't super random. Um, But people, I've, I've had people read a verse and say, what does that mean? And they look down and they see the word blessing and they say, well, we should be a blessing. And then they notice, oh, it says spiritual blessings. We should be spiritual blessings. Did you even read like the sentence? I know this is a smart person, so I know they can, but for some reason they feel like when I come to the Bible, just say some spiritual stuff. So here's a tip. Don't ask yourself, what does this verse mean? Because that's a loaded term and you might just say, what does this verse say? Let me read it again. Just what is it saying? That's just some advice if you struggle with that. Okay. Um, Bev, could you read verse 4 from Ephesians 1? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now this is a perfect verse for what I'm trying to do here because some people have very strong feelings about this topic. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, people have very strong feelings. But guess what? Your feelings don't come into play until after you've at least looked to see what it has to say. Don't, don't bring your feelings in now, whether what you feel about that, because 
you said Calvinism, but I, she just read a verse out of the Bible. Well, but let's see what it has to say first. You see what? We're already jumping into theological interpretation. Let's just look and see what is this saying. So, um, if I ask, what does this verse mean? And someone said, um, Bev, can you read this, this imaginary person's interpretation? If I asked? Well, the, the, and someone said. If someone said the only reason we can be blameless in his sight is because Jesus died on the cross for us and paid for sins and gave us his righteousness. Would that person be right if that's how they interpreted that verse? No, it sounds really good, though. It sounds super right. It is it is true, but it's certainly not the interpretation of that verse. It, and it even uses the phrase blameless in his sight in there. That's the kind of stuff that happens. They read verse 4, and they come away with that interpretation. That's not what that verse says. That All that stuff is true. Like what if I said, I said, if I read this, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That means that God created the world in six days. God did create the world in six days, but that's not what that verse says. So let's, let's go slow. Okay, now to save time, I broke it up into phrases for you. Some people see a list of five random phrases. You can see that little box. Some people, when they read a verse, that's what they see in their mind. Just random, unconnected little phrases. Let's put the phrases in order and then think what they add. So what phrase should go for on the first line? Before the creation of the world. <clears throat> okay, right. Uh, yeah, he chose us. That's the subject and verb of the sentence. That's the first thing. Okay, what does that add to the sentence? Well, it tells us what God did to us. He chose us. Okay, what's the next phrase? In him. What does that add? Jesus. Yes, in Jesus. Okay, so that tells something like where or through what he chose us. He chose us in him. Now we can unpack that later, but we're just saying that's, that's where he chose us. He chose us in him. He didn't choose us in the field. He didn't choose us in the bedroom. He chose us in Jesus. We have to unpack what that means in details later. Jesus did, or God, the Father? Here it doesn't specify the Trinity. So in this context itself, God did. Okay, yeah, so God did in Him, probably referring to Christ, but yeah, you can't see that specifically because I just isolated this verse. Right. But anyway, the point is, in Him is modifying the choosing. Where did the choosing happen? It happened in Him. We can unpack more later. Right now we're just kind of observing it. Um, what comes next? Next line. Okay, so now what does that add? We had, in him was where the choosing happened. What is before the creation of the world? When. Tells when. This is when the choosing happened. He chose me when? Before the creation of the world. That's just what it says. We can talk about theology, free will later, but right now I'm just looking at what this says. He chose me before the creation of the world. And then, <clears throat> uh, let's see, um, to be holy and blameless. What does that tell? What he chose us to do. What he chose us to do. Why? It tells us why he chose us. Or, the, or possibly the result of the choosing. It's either the reason or the result. That's what he chose us for. To be, he chose me to be holy and blameless. And then the last phrase, in his sight, what does that tell us? According to what he sees. What, according, what is according to what he sees? You're choosing? That we're holy, that we're holy and holy. Right. Now, all the phrases have modified the choosing, but now we get a phrase modifying the holy and blameless. Because I'm not blameless, no. but in his sight I am because I've been clothed with Christ's righteousness. 
And in his, eventually I will be, I actually will be in tangible terms. Okay, so we're not going to do uh, page four. We'll save that for next week. But <clears throat> um, homework is to read a Matthew um, 7, 1 through 5, just the first five verses and interpret them. Matthew 7, vastly, crazily misinterpreted passage. Seven, one through five. <clears throat> Most misused passage in the Bible today. No, that's just for homework. For next week, read those five verses and interpret them. You don't have to write it down. Just inter you can interpret them in your mind. You might want to take your time and observe a lot first. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I that. Seven, one through five. And interpret it. And interpret it. <clears throat> Now, we started with baby steps, little tiny phrases and clauses. I know that seems pedantic, but it's very, very important. What's that word you use? Pedantic, like, like I'm treating you like a kindergartner teaching you. Okay? I know that, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to become very important, and you'll start to see, oh, my goodness, I've been interpreting things very sloppily before. <clears throat> 